In listen only mode. Welcome to Westpac's webinar on accelerated and real time aging. I'm Greg Swinghammer. I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You may minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left hand corner. You may expand the panel by clicking on the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few questions during the webinar. However, if we are unable to address your question during the webinar, our presenter will follow up with you via email afterwards. Today's webinar video and slide deck should be available on Westpac's website tomorrow. With that, let's get started. Today's presenter is Katie Tran, a lab manager here at Westpac. She has been with us for over 12 years. Katie, take it away. Thank you, Greg. I am Katie Tran, and I'm very excited to have this opportunity to talk about accelerated aging and real-time aging. Today's topic is an overview of accelerated aging and real-time aging's role in package validation. Let's get started on the presentation. Here's the agenda for the presentation. We will go over terms and definition, stability testing, time versus temperature, its relationship and effects on the products, case studies, ASTM F1980, which is the accelerated aging standard, changes to the 2016 revision, real-time aging, and N would frequently ask questions before we receive questions from the audience. Let's go over the basic terms and definition. Sterile barrier system, or SBS for short. It is a minimal package that prevents ingress of microorganism and allows aseptic presentation of the product at the point of use. For example, here's Minion Dave. He's placed in a plastic layer of film Tyvek pouch on one side. Here's Minion Tim in a thermoform tray with a Tyvek lid. These two minions have been my star role models for many, many presentations because a lot of the products that we test at Westpac here are confidential. It's hard to take a picture without the device in the background or the label of the company being shown. So pictures are worth a thousand words. So my minions are very helpful. Another terms and definition is aseptic presentation. It is an introduction and transfer of, sterile, of a sterile product using conditions and procedures that exclude microbial contamination. The purpose of stability testing is to demonstrate that the SBS maintains integrity over time according to ISO 11607 part one. ISO 11607 is a guidance document. There are two parts, part ones and part two. Our main focus is part one. Stability testing shall be performed using real-time aging. However, we know real-time aging takes a while for it to be completed, so it is acceptable that accelerated aging is considered as sufficient evidence to claim expiration dates until the data from the real-time aging studies are available. Real-time aging and accelerated aging tests should, be done, should begin simultaneously. I want to emphasize stability testing and performance testing are separate entities. They are separate entities. If you're wondering what is performance testing, well, performance testing is used to evaluate the interaction between the package system and the products in response to the stress imposed by the manufacturing, sterilization, and handling storage and shipping environment. For those who aren't familiar with accelerated aging, you're wondering, well, how do I go about to take care of this requirement? Well, like most things, there are standards associated with these test inputs. In this case, it is the ASTM F1980 standard. The standard guide, in, the standard guide for accelerated aging of sterile barrier system for medical devices. 
This brief webinar does not cover the details and understanding of the Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equation is a major, a major item part of ASTM F1980 that will tell you how many days it takes for you to age at what temperature to simulate X amount of shelf life. If this is something you want, please refer to our past webinar for details. Herb and Jorge presented a webinar exclusively to go over the Arrhenius equation and the background information in November of 2014. The link on the slide will take you to that webinar if you want to be demystified by the Arrhenius equation. There is a section in the ASTM F1980 that talks about the post-aging testing guidance. SBS, sterile barrier system, shall be evaluated for both physical properties and integrity. So what are the physical properties and integrity you're wondering? I'll talk about them in the next slide. The popular test inputs for these evaluation. The first one is gross leak detection to ensure no holes or leaks that will allow microorganisms to pass through and contaminate the sterile devices. This looks at the whole package. Looking at the picture on the bottom left, you can see it is a pouch being submerged under one inch of water. If there is a leak coming from that, you will see bubbles forming. In order to be considered a leak, it needs to have a steady stream of bubbles. The second test input that's popular is the seal shrink, also known as peel. It is used to determine how much force it takes to open the package, whether a pouch or a tray. There's no acceptance criteria for this. This should be determined by you, the customer, by doing seal validation, IQ, OQ, and PQ. The very famous acceptance criteria is the one pound per inch requirement. Most of our customers will start off with this. Then when they don't meet this acceptance criteria, they will reduce it and or change the testing technique. There are three testing techniques for peel testing. The unsupported, the first one, which is the most conservative. The second is the supported technique, 180 supported. And the third one is the supported 90 degrees by hand. The two techniques that are very popular among our customers are the unsupported and the supported techniques. Out of the 12 years I've been working here at Westpac, I only have done the supported 90 degrees by hand three times. Aging of a specific sterile barrier system is independent of the physical configuration or contents. The materials and seals are expected to age the same regardless of their physical configuration or contents as long as the process of that sterile barrier system is the same, that is sterilized to the same process. You're wondering, can package performance and aging be combined together? Yes, on occasion, package performance testing may be performed on package systems after aging to evaluate the performance of the aged package system. I want to emphasize, to evaluate the performance of the aged package system during stimulated distribution, handling, and storage, as well to gather evidence of the device component's aging characteristics. If this is your objective, then all aging sample will, should include the devices or assimilate devices in the package and all the packaging material that make up the package system. This will provide a more realistic representation Here's a graph indicating the relationship of time and temperature taken from ASTM F1980. Notice how as you increase the aging temperature, the time it takes to be inside the chamber or oven decreases. So every 10 degrees C increase from the ambient temperature 25, the time is reduced by half. So looking at the first call, first row, 25 
to VC takes about 42.2 weeks. If you go up 35 degrees C, it takes 21.1 weeks, so half the time for every 10 degrees C. According to ASTM F1980, they don't recommend temperatures higher than 60 degrees C because of the higher probability in many polymetric systems to experience nonlinear changes, such as percent crystallinity, formation of free radicals, and peroxide decoration like pouches, thermoform trays. Westpac is even more conservative and only recommends 55 degrees C and uncontrolled RH. When we're talking about aging, we're only talking about temperature and the RH is uncontrolled. We have accelerated aging chambers, also known as oven, at 50 degrees C, 55 degrees C, and 60 degrees C readily available. We can typically start aging within one or three business days, depending on the end date. Some of our customers don't want extra aging days. For example, if we start aging today and it's a Tuesday and it ends on a, on a Saturday, so we'll where our customers say, why don't you wait another day or two and start it so it ends on a weekday and that's when the boxes or samples can be removed. Some customers are in a hurry and they say, just throw it in there. I just want it in the oven. I'm okay with extra time. Another thing is if you want accelerated aging to be conducted at a higher temperature, more than 60 degrees C, we do provide that service as well. Again, I want to emphasize we don't recommend aging temperature higher than 55 degrees C and uncontrolled RH. In the past, I had a customer who had a thermoform tray with a Tyvek lid. The tray was about the size of a sheet of paper, 8 by 11, and a height about 1 to 2 inches. He passed the zero time testing with climatic conditioning, transit bubble, and peel testing. Then he wanted to do accelerated aging by aging it at 60 degrees C to complete his one year shelf life sooner. After 29 days at 60 degrees C and uncontrolled RH, thermoform trays were deformed. Unfortunately, I didn't take a picture of this. This is back a couple of years ago to show to you guys about this. After aging, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. Like the trays were fine for T equals zero, tray was fine after conditioning. What's going on? Why is the tray now to form after aging? That's the only thing it does. You put it in the oven, crank up the temperature, and why would it be to form? He couldn't figure out what's wrong with it since that's what he did. Of course, he asked the questions like, was your aging chamber set to 60? And did it exceed 60? So I tell him, here are the charts. It was right on 60, nothing out of the ordinary. I asked him if he did a design experiment on the thermoform trays. He was like, well, I don't know what's that. I was like, well, go talk to your tray vendor and find out. So when he talked to his vendor, he found out he couldn't age those trays beyond 55 degrees C based on the complexity of his tray and the material thickness in certain areas. So for his next aging study, he used the 55 degrees C aging temperature, reduced it by five. Yes, it did take him long to complete the study, but the end of the 55 degrees C aging, his thermal form trays were not deformed. So he was a happy customer. If you're in a rush to get your shelf life study, like all of our customers, everything needs to be done yesterday, and insist on doing 65 degrees C or 70 degrees C, maybe 75 degrees C, I recommend running two aging studies in parallel. Do the 65 degrees C or the 70 degrees C or higher, but also do the 55 degrees C as a backup plan. When the higher temperature aging is completed and you look at your trays or your pouches, there's something that's wrong or you feel a bubble or the materials deform, you know you still have the 55 degrees C coming in a few weeks to get that data. So you don't have to start from ground zero again. 
If you do pass with a higher temperature, you can terminate the 55 degrees C. I know this will cost you more to get the materials and money to start these tests, but at least you save time and it reduces the risk. For those who aren't up to date with the revision of the standard, there's a new revision to the accelerated aging standard ASTM F 1980. The current revision is 2016, which was released in October of last year. There are a total of four revisions to the standard. 2016 now, 2007, 2002, and 1999 edition one. For this webinar as an added bonus, I, I will mention the changes made in the 2016 revision, so you don't have to waste time to figure that out. The first change is X 3.2 section. The calculation to estimate time for accelerated aging is based on the temperature regardless of the addition of humidity. We tell our customer, please do not consider relative humidity when you're doing accelerated aging. With this new statement, it made it very clear. The second change is X 3.4. The inclusion of relative humidity in aging protocol is not intended as an assessment of the impact of humidity on packaging material. If such an assessment is desired, it should be formed under a separate non-aging protocol that includes predefined humidity extreme. In other words, Westpac's interpretation is conduct climatic conditioning using ASTM D4332 or ASTM F. 2825. According to ISO 11607, accelerated aging and real-time aging should begin at the same time. However, it isn't a normal practice. In an ideal world, zero-time testing, which is conditioning and package performance, are started at the same time as accelerated aging and real-time aging. This way, you have the same batch of samples for different studies. However, most of our customers don't do this. They will ship the zero time samples for testing first to make sure they pass this test sequence before spending time <coughs> and wasting money to build more samples for accelerated aging and real time aging. It's already difficult for a customer to generate X number of samples for testing, let alone provide more samples for accelerated aging and real time aging. Once they pass the zero time testing, they will start the accelerated aging testing, but hold off <coughs> on the real time aging testing until the first aging study is completed and it's passed. So a handful of time our customer who passed the zero time testing would fail the accelerated aging testing because a number of reasons, such as aggressive high temperature for aging, and or temperature not appropriate for their products or packaging material. And that's why they stagger the different studies one after another. We have a real-time aging facility which has its own HVAC system and it's set at 25 degrees C and uncontrolled RH. Most of our customers don't have a specific temperature for real-time aging because after all, it is real-time aging. At the end of the real-time aging study, charts will be provided to show proof of testing. I recommend doing it at a testing laboratory because we provide charts and it will eliminate your coworkers from taking samples from your study. What do, you, what do I mean by that? Yes, it is cheaper to do real-time at your desk, but like I said, when your coworker is short on device for his or her testing, guess who they will be asking? you to borrow their to borrow samples real-time aging takes time quite some time to finish but it's so simple if you just have it at a testing lab preferably us to hold your sample coming from a testing engineer's perspective the most typical part of doing a real-time aging study is returning the samples to our customers the reason behind that is most of our customers will move from one company to another company after one to three years. Aging studies are usually one to three years. 
I have a hard time finding another contact, another customer at the same company to help me out and to take over the project. Up to today, I have two real-time aging studies sitting on my desk that finished real-time aging last year because I cannot locate another contact or the company already is no longer there. We understand the value of these real-time devices as we cannot accelerate age, real-time aging studies. So the normal practice is for us to email everyone in our database for that company, hoping we can find someone to help us out. Once that is exhausted, there's nothing we can do except to dispose of the samples, so it is a waste. Before we get to questions from the audience, let me attempt to see if I can reduce the number of questions by having a section called Frequently Asked Question or spark some questions from this. First question is, what is the most popular aging temperature? Like I said, 55 degrees C is 55 degrees C uncontrolled RH is the most popular one. We do offer 50 degrees C and 60 degrees C for customers who cannot, whose product cannot handle high temperature. And for customers who really want to accelerate age, their accelerate aging study by cranking up the temperature and reducing the time. Next question, what is the norm? Aging without transit or aging with transit? Her customers are split on this one. I mentioned aging and transit testing or package performance testing are separate entities according to ISO 11607. But we still have a handful of customers who combine aging and transit together. They are the conservative group of our customers and may not want to change their procedure. Here's the background for this. Back uh, with the accelerated aging standard of ASTM F1980 in the 2002 revision, there was a flow chart. Looks familiar. This flow chart indicates that the distribution simulation ASTM D4169 shall be conducted after accelerated aging as an example. So our customer will follow this procedure. Then in the 20, 2007 revision of the standard, the full chart was removed. <coughs> so some customers started to separate the aging and transit. Another common question our customer will ask, aging first or after transit? If I am one of those conservative customer, do I do transit first, then aging, or do I do aging first, then transit? It sounds like the chicken and the egg question. I would suggest to these customers to review how they build and ship their devices. For example, if you build to order, an order comes in and you build then ship, then I recommend transit first, then aging, because once the device reached their customer, they will remain on their shelf for a while until ready for use. Therefore, transit first, then aging. But if you build consistently every day and ship when there is a demand, then aging should be conducted first before transit. In the end, as long as you test to what your normal distribution environment and have data to support it, then you should be okay. Now the fun begins. Greg, are there any questions from our audience? Thanks, Katie, for that fine presentation. Yes, we do have a few questions here, and um, we'll continue to take questions for the next little bit. Uh, we want to be respectful of your, all your time, so if we can't get to your questions, um, Katie will follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, we get about five minutes here for questions, so let's get to them. Uh, the first question is, why is humidity not applicable when considering accelerated aging? Katie? I was hoping to eliminate some questions, but humidity is not included in the aging because to accelerate or reduce time, you add heat. For example, when your food is cold, what do you do? You put it in the microwave and you heat it up. You don't add moisture to it. Plus, the RH requirement or the RH percentage is not a variable as part of the Arrhenius equation that is the key equation to determine how much of a shelf life or number of days you need to be in the oven. 
More information can be looked up at our previous webinar, which I mentioned a couple slides back in November 2014, presented by Herb and Jorge regarding demystify of the Arrhenius equation. Cool. Thanks, Katie. Um, the next question is uh, for accelerated aging, what did you mean when you were talking about using 25 degrees C as the ambient temperature? This goes back to that graph, the chart. In there, it has ambient temperature 25 degrees C. The ambient temperature for the Arrhenius equation ranges from 20 degrees C to 25 degrees C. According to ASTM F 1980, 25 degrees C is conservative. The reason why it's conservative is it will require longer time in the aging chamber oven. Our most popular temperature is 23 degrees C because most of our customers say, well, let's just pick the dead smack number in the middle, 23. Cool, Katie, um, thanks. The next question is, um, how many test time points do you need to have before you can claim an expiration date? Is there a minimum? So if, if do you need six month, one year, three year, or can you just do one time point? I'm going to try to attempt to answer this question because the time point is dictated by you, the customer, and also how you're filing as well. Most popular one I heard are 6 months, 12 months, 24 months, but some people do 7 months, 13 months, and 25 months because they want to add one extra month. When they add the extra month in the oven, they still claim it's 6, so depending on where you're filing. So the time point depends on what you want to do. Some people skip the six months because they said, hey, I don't need data right now. I still got time. So they go shoot for one year. Do you remember each time point that you want to claim requires more samples? So depending on what you want and how soon you want your data, hope that answers that question. Cool. Uh, our next question is, what was the name of the equation um, they didn't understand it must have got garbled. I can go ahead and take that one. It's the Arrhenius equation. Um, it's listed in the F1980 standard. Uh, we don't have any other questions at this time point, so want to. Um, if you do think of any other questions you have after, oh, we have another question just popped up. How many samples do you need, or how many samples are recommended for each time point, Katie? <laughs> this is going to be a fun question. The sample size for each time point varies on what is your confidence and reliability. So if you want to claim 90-90, typically that number from what my customer tell me, it is 29 samples. But you want to claim 95-95-59 is the popular one. So if you are doing 29 for t equals 0, which is conditioning and transit, then 29 should be consistent for your other aging time points, unless you can find a statistician to justify why your sample size drop after you finish your t equals 0. Again, popular ones are 29, 30, 59, and 60. So why am I bringing up 30 and 60 now? Most of our medical devices are packed in fives, so people just say, hey, I don't know what to do with the last one, I'll just throw it in there. But if you are only needing 29 or 59, and I will just keep it as that. One extra sample may be that failure. I don't know, so a lot of people don't want to risk that. Back to you, Greg. Thanks, Katie. Um, we had a few more questions roll in here at the end, but we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, and Katie will follow up with you after the webinar. Um, like I was saying, if you have any other questions that come up, you can submit them through westpacks.com slash contacts, and uh, Katie will reply back to you on that. Uh, we're going to send out a survey. We highly value your opinion on the webinar and future webinars that we can provide um, because we're always looking to improve this process. Our next webinar is going to be on Wednesday, June 14th. It's going to be a really good one. It's ISTA testing versus ASTM D4169. Um, again, Wednesday, June 14th, and Tress Wood, uh, test engineer here at Westpac, will be presenting that one. Uh, thanks, everybody. We have two locations one here in San Jose, California, and one in San Diego, California. There's the contact information for those. You can go to our website at www.westpac.com. 
And, you know, I want to thank you all for attending. I'm Greg Schwinghammer. Make it a great day.